In 1896, the actors May Irwin and John Rice took part in what they believed to be the first kiss ever filmed. They sat cheek to cheek in Thomas Edison's New Jersey studio, looking just past each other. They dressed formally, John in a suit, May in a ruffled dress, but their demeanor was breezy as they exchanged some banter that's long since been lost to time. John pulled back, curled his mustache, and brought them together. Then, as the promotional catalog put it, they get ready to kiss, begin to kiss, and kiss and kiss and kiss in a way that brings down the house every time. The resulting movie, aptly titled The Kiss, it did bring the house down. Honestly, despite its sketchy image quality, it still does. The actor's chemistry is undeniable. Even though they weren't partners in real life, their mutual affection is fully convincing. It's so charming, I can't help but get butterflies. Unsurprisingly, The Kiss was a big hit on release, at least as much as an 18 second long movie could be. Audiences couldn't get enough, because at the time, kissing in public was a major taboo. The Christian Puritans had only recently started to lose their grip on the northeastern U.S., and they had shaped the culture there to be viciously sex-negative. It's weird to think now, but the idea of an on-screen kiss was scandalous in 1896, let alone such a playful, flirty one. It probably won't surprise you to hear that the film sparked outcry from the church and the male-dominated press. One critic wrote, Neither participant is physically attractive, and the spectacle of their prolonged pasturing on each other's lips was hard to bear. Magnified to gargantuan proportions and repeated three times over, it is absolutely disgusting. All delicacy or remnant of charm seems gone from Miss Irwin, and the performance comes very near being indecent in its emphasized vulgarity. Such things call for police interference. Of course, that didn't happen. The commercial success of The Kiss showed filmmakers that romance does really well on screen. The film spawned imitators right away, including 1898's Something Good, which was the first kiss between black performers and somehow even more charming. Over the ensuing decades, romance became a genre all its own and a bankable one. 1939's Gone with the Wind and 1997's Titanic each became the highest grossing movies of all time on their release. And if you adjust for inflation, they arguably still are. The reactionaries lost this battle on every front. On the back of this influence, Edison Studios' kiss was deemed culturally, historically, or aesthetically significant, and it was inducted into the American Library of Congress. The kiss being known as the site of this major filmmaking milestone as the first kiss in film history has lent it substantial prestige. Which is funny, because it wasn't. Despite its influence, and despite what most official sources will tell you, the 1896 kiss between May Irwin and John Rice was not the first recorded kiss. Not by a long shot. The actual first kiss came in the 1880s, beating Thomas Edison to the punch by over a decade. That kiss was shot by a British-American photographer named Edward Mybridge. Mybridge was an early filmmaking pioneer. Even if you don't know the name, you've probably seen his animation of The Horse in Motion. His work paved the way for everything that followed. Without Mybridge, there would have been no Edison, no Lumiere Brothers, no Trip to the Moon. He's widely recognized as a trailblazer, and some of his work is still famous today. And yet, the kiss, the first kiss in film history, is utterly obscure. When weighing Edward Mybridge's legacy, this groundbreaking film is treated like a rounding error. It isn't taught in film schools, it's nowhere on Wikipedia, hell, it doesn't even get a mention in the definitive Edward Mybridge biography. Even though it predated the kiss at Edison Studios by at least 11 years, Mybridge's kiss film enjoys neither the fame nor the infamy that its successor has. Instead, it's just sat in some libraries across the United States and Canada, basically undisturbed for the past 140 years. As a modern viewer, this baffles me, because by today's standards, Mybridge's kiss is like three times as scandalous. I'd expect major pushback if it came out today, let alone 120 years ago. If people were angry about the Irwin Rice kiss, there should have been riots in the street over this one. Lately, I've been trying to understand why there weren't. Why there was no response at all to this landmark film. Over the past couple months, I've devoured books, articles, documentaries. I've dug through defunct websites and old museum exhibits. I've sent email after email, trying to unravel the mysteries of Mybridge's kiss. 
How is such a historic moment just forgotten? Why weren't the models wearing any clothes? And above all, why were they both women? Before we get any further, there's a bit of a hitch to telling the story on YouTube. As I just mentioned, both women at the center of the story were photographed, shall we say, garmentless. The film is totally innocent and genuinely not suggestive, but if I played it uncensored, it would definitely land me in some hot water. I found some workarounds here, so you'll still be able to enjoy the video. The story is the same, and you're in for tons of cool stop motion sequences, but if you can, I recommend watching this video on Nebula, the streaming service I'm building with other creators. Nebula hosts the definitive version of this video, ad-free, uncensored as it's meant to be seen. If you want to sign up and watch that version, you can get a discount with my link. I'll share some more about Nebula and our partner Curiosity Stream at the end of the video, but for now let's get to it. Early camera technology was rough. Getting a single photo was a multi-day process involving highly toxic chemicals, and the final image, if you were lucky, came out looking like this. This is the oldest surviving photo, titled View from the Window at Le Gras. It was taken in the mid-1820s in a French village, and you might notice it's awful. I mean, credit where credit's due, the fact that it exists at all is amazing. Taking a picture really was challenging back then, but on its own, it's not a good photo. Without heavy retouching, it's impossible to tell what we're looking at. Early photos like this had some pretty obvious shortcomings. The low fidelity and the lack of color stand out the most here, but with experimentation, these problems were actually resolved surprisingly quickly. Pictures were pretty crisp by the 1840s, and believe it or not, the first color photo was taken in 1861. But one limitation of photography proved more stubborn. It's just as important as the other two, but you can't actually see it. It's the exposure time. Let me explain what that means real quick. In the simplest terms, photography works by shining light onto a flat surface that reacts to the light and makes a copy of it. In the early days, that surface would be a single-use metal plate. These plates weren't very good at their job. They were nowhere near as sensitive to light as cameras are now, so they needed to be exposed to a scene for several hours before any legible image appeared. The view from the window at Le Gras had an exposure time of around eight hours. This placed a hard limit on what photographers could capture, only things that don't move at all. The earliest photographers focused on objects, windows, buildings, rocks, not even water, really, since it flows. You'll notice that early photos of cities usually don't have people in them. That's not because no one walked down the street all day, it's because it only took them a minute to do so. They came and went in a fraction of a percent of the exposure time. They don't even register as blurs. Shooting fast photos proved harder than shooting clear photos or even color photos. In the quarter of a century between the first portraits in 1839 and Edward Mybridge starting out in 1867, nobody had cracked the case. Even after decades of iteration, cameras could only reproduce stillness. And most compelling things involve motion. Enter Edward Mybridge, a real character whose life story could easily get a whole video to itself, but for now I'm going to try to stick to the basics. Mybridge was born in 1830 in the south of England to a family of merchants. He could have stayed in his hometown all his life, he could have worked in the family business and lived and died in comfortable anonymity, but he wanted more for himself. In 1850, at the age of 20, he announced his intentions to seek a fortune out west telling his grandmother, hey you, telling his grandmother, I'm going to make a name for myself. If I fail, you will never hear of me again. One of his first steps was to literally make a name for himself. He changed the spelling of his name at least four times. He was born Edward Muggeridge, then became Muggeridge, then Mygridge, then Mybridge. Finally, he threw a couple of vowels in his first name to become Edward Mybridge, to match with an English king who had ruled 900 years earlier. Really humble guy. Mybridge crossed the Atlantic and established himself as a high-end bookseller, eventually settling in San Francisco. He sold imported books and prints of other people's photos, and he was pretty well regarded in the community. Not famous by any means, but locally successful. Then, 
He was in a terrible accident that probably gave him brain damage and drastically altered his personality. Then he just disappeared to England for several years. It's hard to stay focused with this guy. There's a lot to unpack. Let's just skip ahead to 1867 when he returned to San Francisco, inexplicably having at some point become an excellent photographer. He paid the bills with portrait photography, shooting stuffy portraits of wealth for San Francisco's elite. He also took these beautiful landscapes and cityscapes and sold them under the name Helios, ancient Greek titan of the sun. Ugh. In 1872, his skills caught the eye of Leland Stanford, an ultra-wealthy railroad baron who answered the question, what if Elon Musk was both worse and more powerful? Stanford was into horse racing, and he wanted to settle an argument. When a horse is mid-gallop, what does that look like? Is there a moment where all four legs are in the air? Apparently having nothing better to do with his millions, Stanford hired Mybridge to find out. He asked Mybridge to use photography to freeze time for him, to catch a horse in that precise instant between steps, and answer this question once and for all. It was a big ask. With the available technology, photography's speed problem actually made it impossible. This time, the problem wasn't just the plate, but the shutter, the piece that moves to expose the plate to light for however long it needs. Nowadays, shutters are automatic, but at the time, photographers moved them themselves like this. Reliably doing this in a 50th of a second is basically impossible. And if you're even a 10th of a second late, your photo comes out so overexposed, it's useless. Mybridge worked on the project on and off for six years, taking a break midway through to have a kid, tour Central America, and uh, commit homicide. He shot a guy. I'm trying so hard to stay on track here. In 1878, after years of subpar results, Mybridge finally had his eureka moment. He rigged a camera shutter to be operated not by a person, but by a tripwire. He lined up 24 cameras along a racetrack, attached tripwires to each one, and then a jockey ran a horse down the track. Each time the horse passed a camera, a photo was taken automatically at the perfect time for the perfect interval. You've seen the pictures before, so you know how powerful they are. The horse in motion strips away all romanticism and shows us how horses actually move, all four legs off the ground, and not floaty and effortless like we might imagine, but heavy, deliberate, wild. Mybridge was the first person to harness the full power of photography. He was in a league of his own for a while. While his contemporaries struggled to get shots in a tenth of a second, he consistently nailed them in a hundredth or a five hundredth. The camera setup he devised to shoot the horse was so ahead of its time that the Matrix was hailed as groundbreaking for doing the same thing over a century later. Instantaneous photography had obvious potential, so Mybridge got to wondering, what other secrets might be hiding in split seconds? A few years passed. In 1882, Stanford published a book about the horse experiments titled The Horse in Motion, as shown by instantaneous photography, with a study on animal mechanics founded on anatomy and the revelations of the camera, in which has developed the theory of quadrupedal locomotion. He had room for that title, but apparently not enough room to give Mybridge credit for his work. Stanford positioned himself as the genius behind it all, and everyone else as lowly workmen. Mybridge was understandably angry over the snub. What people were calling the greatest discovery yet made in photography was being credited to some jerk who didn't know how to use a camera. It was a major hit to his character, so he sued the publisher and Leland Stanford sued one of the richest men in California. It went how you'd expect. Down his biggest patron, with no way to finance new experiments, Mybridge embarked on a speaking tour of the US and Europe. He explained how he took the world-famous horse photos and showed off his new invention, the Zopraxiscope, an early projector that could bring still images back to life, literally reanimating the horse and jockey. After a lecture in Philadelphia, Mybridge was approached by a few influential locals, some businessmen, and high-ranking members member of the University of Pennsylvania. They could see how much more could be done with Mybridge's technique, and they wanted to help him do it. The Pennsylvanian men proposed Mybridge move to Philadelphia, build a bigger, better set than he'd had on the West Coast, upgrade his camera gear, and photograph a comprehensive catalog of bodies in motion. Some of animals, but most this time of humans, all under the banner of the University of Pennsylvania. 
this was prestige. While the university paid for the series, Mybridge was a businessman at heart, and he could only make a profit by selling the work somehow. He found a good angle here, marketing prints to artists. Photos like these were basically anatomical references, showing how bodies move while performing a whole array of actions. These photos could be perfect art models, who never flinched, never got tired, and could hold a momentary pose for days on end. Mybridge had his work cut out for him. Over the next four years, he would photograph men, women, children, and animals performing every kind of motion he could think of. The project's scope was epic in the original sense of the word. Mybridge took over 100,000 photos and published references for at least 781 kinds of movement. Anything where the body moves in a unique way was fair game. Quick or strenuous actions were especially impressive. The way these transient details turned eternal, the model's raised shoulders, the focus in their eyes, the slightest flexion in their muscles. Some of the motions were shot with models fully dressed. For those ones, the goal might have been to see how their clothes move, the distinctive stiff suits and hoop skirts of the late 19th century. But most of the time, bodies were the focus. And in those cases, to capture the maximum detail, the subjects performed without clothes on. Most of the shots involve one person performing solo. But of course, there are some things you can't do alone. There's no solo boxing or handshake. To suit those situations, Mybridge also shot a variety of group scenes, pairs of people doing things like dancing or manual labor, again mostly undressed. As I combed through the archive while researching this video, I realized something interesting about these disrobed group shots. The gender relations on display are wild and not at all what I expected. I found some scenes of two men together, always in very macho situations, boxing, hammering on an anvil, and so on. This part makes sense, that kind of thing was restricted to men. But then, for anything remotely more neutral, anything that wasn't extremely manly, Mybridge used two women. Never a man and a woman, always two women, in playful shots, in pensive moments, in domesticity together. These 19th century women posing nude and dancing, or serving each other tea, or smoking a cigarette, or, well, kissing. Kissing is a thing bodies do sometimes, and something artists depict all the time, so of course Mybridge wanted to capture it. But using a man and a woman was totally out of the question. A couple kissing on camera? The university would be ruined. Women kissing, on the other hand. Sure, whatever, go ahead. From what I can tell, this scene went off without a hitch. I mean, if it was controversial, you'd expect some mention of that in the local papers, and I couldn't find any. It was a non-issue, actually less controversial in the 1800s than it would be now. Because back then, there was nothing suggestive about two women kissing. The queer women in the crowd know where this is going. This is just another instance of the infamous Sappho and her friend effect. When these photos were taken, sexuality was strictly the domain of men. Women weren't thought to have any drive or desire of their own. So you could photograph two women doing just about anything together without ruffling feathers. She's not kissing her. She's just... Uh... Greeting a fan. Ugh, we've all been there. I love to greet my fans. This kind of reaction is especially ridiculous in the case of Mybridge's kiss, which was unambiguously meant to be romantic. Remember, these were anatomy guides for artists. The idea was that a painter would use one as a stand-in for a man, and then paint a straight couple kissing. To facilitate that, Mybridge directed one of these women to take on a male role, to be dominant in the frame, to actively pursue the other. That way, artists could copy off her body language. This was never intended as a friendly kiss between two ladies. It was an imitation of a romantic straight kiss, both performers being women only so they could get away with shooting the thing. You might have noticed that 20 odd minutes into this video, I still haven't told you the names of the women in the kiss. That's because I don't have their names. No one does. There is pitifully little known about the models in Mybridge's motion studies. They were never credited by name, so we just don't know. 
Even in the monumental, world-famous horse photos, the jockeys were listed by partial names, G. Dom and C. Martin, and no one's conclusively tracked them down. We literally know more about the horses. <laughs> Mybridge did keep records, and the records mentioned the women in the kiss, just not by name. In a catalog of all the motion studies, he listed them as Model 1 and Model 8, and he gave some passing remarks on who they were. Model 1 was a widow, age 35, quote, somewhat slender and above the medium height. Model 8 was unmarried and some age under 25. They were photographed together a handful of times, never clothed. That's all we have to go on. If we want to learn anything else about who they were, we have to turn to the kiss itself. As a history nerd, and frankly as a lesbian, I've combed this film for clues about the real people behind it. Unfortunately, I've mostly come up short. They don't wear any clothes or jewelry that might tip us off about their social class or culture. Their body language is posed and unnatural, no hints whether they're more masculine or feminine, or whether they're enjoying themselves for that matter. Their figures are pristine and pastless. A person's scars, wrinkles, and stretch marks hint at the life they've lived, and here I can find none to speak of. Sometimes I wonder if there's something going on with number one's smile. I wonder if I catch a glimmer of excitement in her eye, but it only lasts one frame. Eventually, I realize I'm grasping at straws here, pouring over 90 noisy pixels trying to see myself in them. The Rice Irwin kiss, in all its shamelessness, triggered massive uproar in the media and in the church. It rode this wave of backlash to fame. The church said, this movie is filthy, and Edison responded, this movie is filthy. <laughs> when Edison Studios released the movie, they knew full well this was going to happen. It was actually their marketing strategy. Counterintuitively, since Mybridge's kiss was between two women, it never could have reached that level of controversy, and thus didn't have that path to fame. Actually, Mybridge's kiss didn't have any path to fame, because when it was shot, movies didn't exist yet. Way to bury the lead, I know. This is a tricky thing to get your head around. Mybridge did shoot several consecutive frames of things in motion, and he even projected them back in real time to a live audience. But technically, technically they weren't films. You see, going by the original definition, a film consists of several frames captured by one camera in one go. When Mybridge shot his motion studies, cameras weren't capable of that yet. His cameras could only shoot one frame each before being manually reset. That's why he used as many as 24 of them at a time. There was no other way to shoot motion. And once you filmed a thing, you also had to be able to play it back. Screening technology was even further behind than camera technology at this point. Mybridge had literally just invented the Zoopraxiscope in 1880, that proto-projector he used on his speaking tour. It was this really quirky contraption. It was hand-cranked, and it worked by shining a light through a spinning disc that held all the images you wanted to show. And it couldn't show the original photos. The figures from them had to be manually traced, one by one, onto a glass disc. Undeniably very cool, but probably closer to rotoscope animation than live-action film. Besides, only a few lucky motion studies were given this treatment, and there's no sign the kiss was one of them. It's up to you how much you want to let this bug you, whether it ruins the magic. Personally, I don't think the distinction between a movie and a series of photos really matters anymore. First of all, through the power of editing, all things are possible. We can all agree that Chicken Run isn't just a really fast slideshow. Second of all, in the digital age, who cares if a thing can be projected or not? How many of you are watching this in a movie theater right now, and how many are watching on your phones, you know? If My Bridges Kiss wasn't a movie by the old standards, it is by ours. The original format not being a movie does kind of take away from its historical importance, though. For most of its life, the kiss was just a couple dozen pictures, no different from the thousands of others Mybridge took in his career. By the 1880s, we surely already had photos of people kissing, so these ones didn't especially stand out. 
The kiss didn't make it into the original reference books that were sold to artists, so it can only be found in a collection called Animal Locomotion, this 11 volume, 20,000 photo behemoth that lives mostly in academic libraries. Sitting on a shelf somewhere, its level of exposure was nowhere near what the Rice Irwin kiss received. You couldn't walk into a theater and watch this on a screen, you'd have to actively seek it out. An average person wouldn't have known the Mybridge kiss existed, and they would have no way to play it back if they did. You can get everything from the Boston Public Library. Like I brought in a scanner that I had modified. I'd cut the bottom out so I could see where I was because, you know, you can't flip the books over because they're precious and of course scanning them. And they're like, you know what? This is such a cool project. We're just going to scan it all and put it online. Lucky for us, Dave Gordon, the man who unearthed My Bridges Kiss, is not an average person. Back in 2011, he was working on an animated film called Victorian Dream that was to be constructed entirely out of scenes from My Bridges motion studies spliced together to build a narrative. The project landed him in the special collections department of the Boston Public Library, where they have a nearly complete copy of Animal Locomotion. While paging through Animal Locomotion, Dave found himself on page 444, quote, two models shaking hands and kissing each other. The images jumped out to him right away. He could tell he'd found something special, even something historic. So he brought it back to life. He did so in more ways than one. Dave is the reason anyone knows about Mybridge's kiss today. He took the story to the press for Valentine's Day 2011, and since then it's popped up every couple years on blogs and news sites. Regrettably, some of these articles get the basic facts wrong. The Daily Mail absolutely butchered it. It wasn't footage, and it wasn't shot in 1872. Get your facts straight. <sighs> Ugh. I'm so annoyed with myself. This project has turned me into such a hyper-focused crank. I wish this kind of thing didn't bug me, but it, it bugs me so much. I figured that back in 2011, Dave became the first person ever to animate the kiss. He's credited this way in several sources, and Dave himself backed up my assumption when we talked. No, I think the first time it was ever seen as a film was when I put it together as a film. But then, I watched this documentary from 1975 called Edward Mybridge, Zoopraxographer. It was directed by a film student named Tom Anderson, and like 40 minutes in, he just casually drops the kiss in, like it's nothing. The narrator doesn't even mention it. So we were wrong. Everyone was. And no shame to Dave for this, by the way, I happened onto this by pure luck, and his version is easily better. But it turns out the forgotten kiss wasn't so forgotten after all. It was unearthed and animated almost 50 years ago. So yeah, I don't think it's really surprising that at the time it wasn't given credit. I actually think it's more surprising that nobody really cared once it was really discovered, rediscovered. You think it should have gotten more press once you rediscovered it? Yeah, I think so. Yeah, I mean, I think that you know, there's you're still giving Edison a lot of a lot of credit for his kiss, which is is fine. But I think it's an important moment. I think that it uh, it it raises a lot of really interesting questions as well. The whole, it wasn't a movie thing, it only gets us so far. Sure, it was trapped in archives and libraries for most of its life, but now it's had nearly half a century to spread and still mostly hasn't. We know why it was overlooked, it was hard to find. But if that's not true anymore, why is the kiss still overlooked today? Well, if we set aside all historical factors and just engage with the kiss as a movie, it's actually not a great movie. It pains me to say this, but beyond the initial surprise of, oh wow, two ladies kissing, it doesn't give a viewer much to latch onto. It feels stiff in the same way as those early portrait photos where the subject sat still for ages and couldn't emote. Despite it literally being two women kissing without clothes on, I don't sense any intimacy here. It seems like these women are friendly, but not close. Comparing Mybridge's kiss film to the far more famous Edison Studios kiss, one is obviously more potent. Where Mybridge's kiss feels insincere, Edison's is enchanting. John is eager to win May over. May rolls her eyes in that way you do when you know a person's tricks, but she can't hide her grin. John presses right up to her face in total comfort. You can imagine years of personal history leading up to this moment, and countless other moments like it over the years. It feels, to me, like a genuine portrait of an enduring love. The 
This is kind of ironic, considering Edison's is easily the less authentic of the two. Mayerwin and John Rice were actors, after all. They were assuming roles and reading pre-written lines. But they're good actors. They embody their characters really well. The anonymous women in Mybridge's film don't seem nearly so at ease. I don't know. For all my fascination with the project, the thing itself is maybe a six. But maybe I'm grading it on the wrong scale here. It's not like Mybridge tried to create an appealing, emotive film and failed. His work often balanced artfulness and science, and the Locomotion series was ostensibly all science. An anatomy series, first and foremost, using photography as a way to get to the truth about the natural world, to capture movement objectively and free of idealism, even when the end result was underwhelming. So on this project, he made some decisions that would emphasize motion and sideline the rest. The cameras are placed several feet away at waist level, which makes the model's expressions harder to read. The background is a plain grid that enables precise measurement, but feels anything but sensual. Oh, and by this point, the cameras ran on timers, so the models had to complete the motion at a fixed pace. They couldn't go with the flow. The lead into the kiss takes five frames, but the kiss itself barely lasts two. As a result of all these measures, most of his anatomy photos feel clinical. They capture how things look, but not always how they feel. That's forgivable if it's in the name of science, if these are accurate, objective depictions of human motion. But are they? I'm skeptical of anything that claims to be objective. We all have our own perspectives molded by the ideologies and power structures of our time, and that includes scientists. If you look at an image, you can almost always find bias dictating what we're shown and how it's framed. With Mybridge, you don't have to look very hard. Mybridge was known to embellish. If one frame of a motion study wasn't to his liking, he would toss it and splice in a frame from a different take. This would give a prettier result, but a less honest one. Sometimes he went even further. In 1877, he announced he'd perfected instantaneous photography a year before he actually did, and sent this photo to newspapers as proof. But as I imagine you can tell, this is a painting. Mybridge took a photo and had an artist paint over it, presumably to get rid of the motion blur. Even when his results weren't outright fabricated, his personal biases did distort what was being shown. First, consider the models. They're not your average women, they're young and conventionally beautiful. They were actually pre-selected to be. Because while the men in Mybridge's photos were generally students, professors, and athletes, the women were dancers and models. And they're white, of course. Almost everyone he photographed was. Philadelphia was decently diverse even in the 1880s. A Mybridge anatomy book was not an honest cross-section of the city where it was made. Second, consider the poses. A lot of the poses Mybridge captured were not scientifically important, and they wouldn't be of much use to artists either. Men in suits leapfrogging, women falling into hay bales. He probably just thought they looked interesting. The poses he assigned to women were often demeaning. He put his female models, including one and eight, in unpleasant positions. He made them crawl around, pour water on each other, run away while hiding their faces in shame. And his photos of disabled subjects, both women and men, could be downright humiliating. I'm gonna avoid showing them here because I don't think they should exist. Mybridge's regimented scientific photos use the conventions of neutrality. But his photos of women and disabled people tell a story of a man who took pleasure in exerting power over others. What was pitched as methodical and objective instead feels cruel and uncaring. Remember, we're dealing with a man who named himself after an English king, who credited early photos to the titan of the sun. By all accounts, a massive egotist driven by a desire to go down in history. Would a guy like that erase himself from his own work? He was at the helm of this unprecedented, probably very expensive project, with near total discretion over what was produced. I think he would have wanted to see his worldview represented. When I see his photos of adult women crawling on their hands and knees, or MS patients struggling to walk, I can't read them as anything but raw expressions of dominance. The tragedy of Mybridge's kiss is that it tells us more about Mybridge than it does about the women kissing. While his sensibilities are plain to see, everything but their bodies has been scrubbed from the frame. 
The irony that this video talked mostly about Mybridge and not about the women you came here to learn about is not lost on me. Unfortunately, I've told you everything I know. None of us can access the full context of this kiss. Whether the models were excited or reluctant or it was just a job. Everything natural about it has been paved over, both by the man who shot it and by the homophobia of the time enclosing the realm of what's possible. But just because we can't see anything deeper doesn't mean there was nothing there. Photography is the act of freezing a moment in its own timeline, allowing us to imagine its subjects enjoyed neither past nor future. Zopraxography, as invented by Mybridge, might just be its antidote. It's the act of reanimating a static thing, letting a single moment move through time with us. For my bridge's kiss, this feels like the only path forward. I refuse to believe models one and eight slipped into existence for a few photos and then vanished without a trace. Whoever they were, they were people with stories, shames, and aspirations like the rest of us. I want to keep them moving. I want to pull them into the present and learn how they would have lived outside the edges of my bridge's suffocating frame. And if I can't, well, the least I could do for them is wonder. Venting beneath your dress, take a tip from me. Mind the bird wings beating, picturesque, and those buzzing bees. Oh, soft skinned soldier, you are statuesque. Let your hair. your nakedness undo your blueberry blouse hey you just listened to me ramble about film history for 40 minutes first of all thanks i genuinely had a blast making this second of all if you enjoy this kind of deep dive, you should go watch my conversation with Dave Gordon on the life and times of Edward Mybridge. He was a fascinating guy. His life story is one of scandal, betrayal, and as mentioned, literal homicide that he got away with. He was the last person in California history to get away with murder on the grounds that it was an honor issue. An honor issue. It was a justifiable homicide. It was essentially an honor kill. And they decided that was okay. We talked about it for ages, and you can find that video on Nebula, the creator-owned streaming service I'm lucky enough to be a part of. If you use my link, you can get a year of Nebula and our partner Curiosity Stream for under $15, which is less than either one cost on its own. Curiosity Stream, of course, is a documentary streamer with thousands of titles. Today, I'm going to recommend you check out their new miniseries, Titans, The Rise of Hollywood. It's about the early days of the film industry, the silent film explosion, and the vicious drama and backstabbing behind the scenes. So head on over to curiositystream.com slash lilyalexander to sign up. Watch my bonus video on Nebula, watch Titans on Curiosity Stream, or watch both. I'm not your dad. Thanks to both of them for sponsoring this video. Whew. A lot of people to thank today, actually. The music in today's video came from a couple of my favorite albums. I got set design and lighting help from my partner, Vic. Leah McKinnon and Dave Gordon were both so generous with their time and helped me get the facts right here. Thinking it might be a good idea to credit the actual people who were in the video. Don't know how I missed that on my first try. Um, so thanks to everyone I took pictures of for this video. Uh, they all did great. That's going to be France Bonville, Sarah Talbot, Abby Yeager, Ariane Lucie Gendron, Léonie Beaulieu, Yamina, whose last name I did not ask for, S. Avery Lake, and Maya Fernandez-Giles. Thank you to all of them. And who could forget the Patreon supporters who gave me the financial security to spend two months learning about one time a couple ladies smooched and it was fine. <laughs> A special shout out to the following patrons. 
Smaz Ruby, Rose Dale, Gwen Lofman, Violet Graves, Cersei Quake, Samari Braley, Colin Coltrera, Chloe Jane, Rose Juliet, Momo, Jesse Earl, Linda Jewers, Sandy Smith, Quinn Osgood, Charlie B, Ricka Coy, Non Anonymous, Tara Moth, Megahertz, Summer D, Jane Malcolm, Erica Peterson, The Numeral One, Mid Tier Art, Mary Wishart, Cherie Monjovi, Kana Q, Detective Meow Meow, Emily McLean, Rhea Chapel, Kiki, Olivia Grimes, Tracy Renan and Tell, Trans Femme Flim Flam, Duck Grows Chilies, Alejandro Hernandez, Nuclearite, Scott Sometimes Lucy, Arcadius, Quillworth, Henry Rachutin, Taylor Hardy, Dan Lazote, Zara Julia, Imperiatrix, Fly Girl, Square 44, Jasperi Wertanen, Basil Bennett Levy, Gia Maria Caterina Santa Lucia, Ruby Landau Pincus, Dr. Haley Isabella Colley, Sasha Karbachinsky, Matilde, Chris B. Tender, Margot Boivin, Otherwise Lovely, Yuna, Celeste Blossom, Joe Azar, The Recognition Scene, Blueberry Hill, Izzy, Emily Martins, Charlie H., Darla Butler, Benjamin Stone, Wimble Limble, Clara Griffin, Scatterflower, Cassie, Lee Slothpope, Aaron Laura, Jesse Rayner Bloodgood, Emma Casley, Callan, Morgan Batan, Ava Walker, Coralie, Guillaume, Caitlin, Rebecca Gale, Ivy, Cannon, Fox Oslander, River, Joel Durham, ZHL, Maddie Mamode, Claire Anderson McGilligott, Harmony, Lillian, and finally, Catherine Ann McCloskey Ross. Helping me make this video? That's gay rights, baby. No, that's gay liberation. You're heroes. 